wonderful to be back in Salt Lake. I don't get back here as much uh, as I would like, and thank you to Victor for the, the wonderful introduction. So first, a warning. Uh, this talk contains both metaphysics and cursing. I gave this talk uh, to my mother uh, because this is the first time I've given it, and I called her up and I said, okay, let's, let's go over this talk, you know, and she's like, okay, let's, let's, let's hear it. And I give her the talk, and then she sits really quietly for a minute, and she said, son, you know, most people have one of two problems. They either overthink something or they underthink something, and I don't know how you've managed to do both at the same time, but that was impressive. And um, I said, well, I'm your son, and... Uh, she didn't really accept that. This talk uh, begins with uh, a discussion of, um, of Don Quixote. Don Quixote, in Don Quixote, we have Sancho Panza who said, now look, your grace, what you see over there are not giants, they are windmills. And what seems to be their arms are just their sails that go round in the wind and turn the millstone. And obviously, replied Don Quixote, you do not know much about adventure. And this year we are celebrating 20 years of open source and it is, has been an adventure worthy of a night. Because when open source came into this world in 1998, how different everything looked. In 1998, Microsoft had a 98% market share. You mentioned open source anywhere in the city of Redmond, Washington and you would get run out on a rail Apple had not yet come up with a little operating system called OS X and wouldn't for another three years. There was no such thing as an Android phone because the idea that you would run an operating system on a telephone was nonsense. Oh, and that year, that was the year that a couple of Stanford students registered a funny domain name uh, while they were working out of a garage in Menlo Park. If you don't know what that is, just uh, Google it. There was no GitHub. There wouldn't be GitHub. In 1998, there wouldn't be GitHub for another 10 years. And if somebody came along and tried to describe 2018 to you, and what they told you was, oh, there's this thing called GitHub, and it does this thing called open source, and it got purchased by Microsoft, you would have an aneurysm on the spot. Because it's almost as if the future of what open source would become was foretold all the way in 1585 when Cervantes put his knight on a horse and sent him off from La Mancha to wander the countryside to tilt at windmills. It has been a wonderful time. It's been full of misadventures, villains, looking at you, Sco, heroes, successes, and failures. And is it really any wonder that so how much of the world and the way that it works today comes to, to us from Eric S. Raymond's seminal work on software development that he wrote in 1998? He gave us this idea of the cathedral and the bazaar perhaps the most important and foundational text on open source. But the thing is that Raymond gave us a fundamental insight, not just into the way that software works, because he saw it not just as an engineering problem, but as a problem of knowledge. He said, we need to do more than just think about how our development teams are structured. We need to do more than think about how we write code in isolation. But what Raymond really wanted to do at the end of the day was rethink about how knowledge itself was structured. He saw this as a problem of epistemology. He wrote, given enough eyeballs, all the bugs are shallow. And he showed us that if work can be made into play, if we played together, we could do great things. And he, he showed us the difference between this idea of developing software and what he called the cathedral model, wherein open source modifications were restricted to this small set of developers at corporations. And a bizarre model where code is developed over the internet with hundreds or thousands of participants. And this was a really fitting end to the 20th century, to have this brilliant burst of creative energy show us something that could remake the way that the world worked. And it did. But just like what Don Quixote will tell you, revolutions are not so clear cut. And is the world today what Eric Raymond envisioned when he imagined what a participatory culture could look like? Because who is allowed to participate and who is not? And did we see things like the negative effects of social media on human knowledge? And did we think all the way through the effects of AI or the legal issues or the ethical issues? And by the way, does everybody have a voice in this bazaar that Raymond described to us? Our voice is being drowned out. Did we build the meritocracy that we imagined was lying dormant in our shared humanity? Or did we build something else entirely? But to start, we have to start at the beginning. Because there was an age where free software was basically unheard of and commercial software vendors ruled the earth. 
But there was a band of software zealots deep inside MIT, and they had a different idea. They heard the voice of Don Quixote when he was talking to his squire, Pancho Sanza. Pancho Sanza. He said, for neither good nor evil can last forever. And so it follows that evil has lasted a long time. Good must now be close at hand. Good and evil. That's quite a topic. And that's the topic of this talk today. Because we have a history to look back on. And we have a history to, er, to look forward to and to build. And, you know, a while ago I was cruising Facebook back before being on social media, media made me want to kill myself. And I got into this argument with my friend because he went to this other conference and he heard this other keynote and this person was up there and they were saying, oh look, you know, diversity and inclusion are important and we need to do all these things. And he was like, man, you know, I just want to talk about tech. Why can't we just talk about tech? And like my initial response, of course, was, have you looked at the tech industry? Have you lost your damn mind? Like, how can we be talking about anything other than this? And then I, I had to admit eventually that he had kind of a good point. Why should we be talking about stuff other than tech? Why shouldn't we be talking about morality and ethics along with technology? Why aren't those first-class citizens in our discussion? And I wanted to figure this out because it really started to bother me. And so, like any good engineer, uh, I set off trying to sort this out. Because it seems sort of silly, but then again, does it? Richard Stallman is a complicated fella. And that's just kind of a nice way of saying that he's been acting like an asshole for a couple of years now. But even so, Richard Stallman is a part of history. And if nothing else, Richard Stallman is a man who never met a manifesto that he did not like. And he wrote more than a few. But more than that, he was a brilliant technologist and he was a great software developer. But Stallman was also a thinker who worked not just on software because he was interested in software, but he was interested in problems of ethics. And software was the lens through which he saw some of these problems that existed in society crystallized into these real problems that he could identify and begin to work with. And one of the big problems that Stallman saw was this relationship between large private corporations controlling the software that he wanted to use and what he called the freedom of individual users. Right? And it wasn't, it's really interesting that Stallman chose this word, freedom. He was not messing around. He could have gone with choice or alternative, but no. This was freedom. And you have to remember the world that he was working in. This was 1985. Like, this was punk rock, man. Right? And not just punk rock, but 1985 was the era of philosophical post-structuralism. We had thinkers who were pushing back against this world of structuralism that said that freedom was impossible because every choice carried with it this inherent you know, connection to time, place, politics, and history, and what have you. And Stallman just thought that was crap. He thought he could break out of all of this, that he could remake this entirely. Stallman thought, we can break out of this construction, we can break out of these limits that have defined the way uh, that we used to use technology, and we can do something new. This was about punk rock, this was about freedom, this was about revolution. And so Stallman sat down and he wrote a manifesto. He wrote an essay called, Why I Must Write GNU. And we should pause for a moment to consider his choice of words. Not should, not can, must. I must write GNU. Because when you think about it, that's sort of crazy. That's a crazy thing to say. Because this was punk rock, but this was also German idealism. This was the age of enlightenment, man. Because Richard Stallman was, in effect, describing what ethicists and philosophers call a moral imperative, right? A moral imperative are a special a set of responsibilities uh, brought to us by Immanuel Kant, right? He called this the categorical imperative. And Kant tried to show that morality was more than just this utilitarian hypothesis, right? But he said that moral reasoning could exist on this plane that didn't require empirical evidence and could be determined through pure practical reasoning. And when you apply this pure practical reasoning, what this results in for Kant is this idea of duty. He looked at maxims that could be, could be made universal for pure reasons, and then he said, you have a duty not just to act by this maxim, because um, it results in a logical contradiction when applied to everything. Right? And effectively, this is a little bit like the golden rule, right? Um, not exactly, but a little bit. Act as if the maximum of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. The golden rule, right? And Stallman wrote about the golden rule in his manifesto. He said, I consider that the golden rule requires that if I like a program, I must share it with other people. I refuse to break solidarity with these users. I cannot get in good conscience sign a software license agreement. 
He said, for years I worked within the artificial intelligence lab at MIT to resist such tendencies and other inhospitalities, but eventually they had gone too far. I could not remain in an institution where such things are done for me against my will. At the heart of what Stallman was arguing for was this idea of egalitarian freedom. This came from the golden rule, from the Christian tradition. This comes from Kant. Act as if your maxim of your action through your will were to become a universal law of human nature. It was Kantian duty. Freedom was a duty, and GNU was born. And as the free software mo movement grew and grew from this tiny seed of Richard Stallman's act, uh, we did many exciting things. The entire economics of software development began to change. We had projects like the Linux operating system that began to grow, and we went on and on and on. And so by the birth of the open source movement in 1998, we were 13 years into Stallman's quest, and Microsoft's market share had dropped from 98% to 98%. So what was going on? And to answer that question, I'd like to consider us another question in, in, in return. And I think this is a really hard question. What is the difference between freedom and opportunity? Freedom and opportunity. Because the difference here illuminates everything from political theory to metaphysics to economics, and yes, even software development. Because we think of this as being the, the same thing, but it's really not. So there's this guy uh, who teaches at Tufts University, and his name is Daniel Dennett. And what he came up with was this really neat example to think about this problem. And he calls this the whimsical jailer, right? Dan Danit says, okay, imagine that you have this jail, and inside you've got this jailer, and because this jailer's kind of a nutcase, every night he sneaks around the jail, waits for all the prisoners to go to sleep, so they're totally sound asleep, couldn't possibly wake up, no chance of that, they're asleep. They're all very sound sleepers. And he goes around and he unlocks all of the doors while they're sleeping. And then he's just, I don't know what he does after that. He just like sits and, you know, is weird or something. Uh, and then he goes around and he, um, before the prisoners wake up, he locks all the doors again. And the question that Dennett asks, he says, look, are these prisoners free? Are these prisoners free? And if you think about that, that's the relationship between freedom and opportunity. You can't have the sort of freedom that Stallman wanted us to have, that he believed that we should have, unless we have the opportunity to exercise it. Right. So the GNU project gave us you know, some freedom, but the search for widespread opportunity remained somewhat limited. And there were a lot of reasons for this, right? Software development was still hard to understand. We didn't have really good cooperative models. If you ever sent like a patch to a mailing list, you probably know this. Um, but uh, all of a sudden, you know, we, had, we started to have open source. We had licenses start to emerge. We had systems of collaboration that were vastly improved. And opportunity exploded. And for one like, interesting economic reason, service-based companies began to emerge, and they began to see free software. And they began to realize that they could make money with this. They said, oh my goodness, here's software that we can get for free, and we can operate a service-based model. And then sometime in the early 2000s, people woke up and decided to put a name on this, and they called it cloud computing. And those of us who live in Utah go, yeah, no kidding, Pete Ashdown invented that in 1993. However, the GNU revolution was about freedom. But the past 20 years of open source has been about opportunity. Just a few weeks ago, Abby Kearns from the uh, Cloud Foundry Foundation put it perfectly. She said, open source gives us the opportunity to do things we could never do on our own. Diversity of thought and participation is what makes open source so powerful and so innovative. And that is exactly right. So what's next? We started with freedom. And open source took that freedom, brought us opportunity. So where does that leave us? Well, look around. I don't know if you follow the news or you get out in the world, but things are not amazing, right? Many things are very cool. Some things, not so cool, right? We have social media companies doing some things that I think raise very serious ethical questions of uh, democratic elections. We have companies harvesting huge amounts of data. We have governments conducting surveillance operations. And we have enormous inequality in our communities and in our companies. And if you think that all of that isn't enabled by open source, of course it is. It is. So we've totally covered the problem of distributing cute videos to cats to a worldwide audience, but we're still coming up short on issues like climate change or global poverty. 
So we've talked about freedom, we've talked about opportunity, but what I want to spend the remainder of the time with you today is talking about the third wave. Beyond freedom, beyond opportunity, what do we need to do for the next 20 years? Friends, the next 20 years must be the wave of responsibility. Because opportunity without responsibility creates chaos. There's a little known scholar, his name is Hans Jones, he's a German academic who wrote in the mid-20th century, and he wrote this amazing text that you can go find, it's called The Imperative of Responsibility. And Jonas wrote about a lot of things. One of the things he was most brilliant about was writing about the potential impact of technology, and he wrote something that I think is remarkable. He said, the altered nature of human action by technology with the magnitude and novelty of how it works and their impact on man's global future raises more issues for which past ethics geared to the dealings of man with his fellow man within narrow horizons of space and time have left us unprepared. Eth the past ethics have left us unprepared. And he asks, what force shall represent the future in the past? And what a tremendous question this is. What force shall represent the future in the past? Because suddenly we're faced with this notion of having to account for ethics in the technology that we build. Because as technologists, we must fundamentally be ethicists. We cannot escape this problem. If you think you can, you are wrong. For it's surely true that we're building forces today that will represent us in the future, whether it's in the software we build or the business decisions that we make or the lives that we lead, but we must ask hard questions of ourselves. Because we've said collectively it doesn't matter so much what we build because we've told this, we've had this idea that everything can be used for good and evil. Therefore, where does the culpability lie? Well, where does the culpability lie? In 2015, Google removed Don't Be Evil from their company Credo. Because in the Brothers Karam's off, there's this wonderful quote that says, don't lie to yourself. And I like this because not only is this a great quote for life, but it's a really good quote for engineering because every bug that you write comes from a lie. It comes from a lie about the way that you thought that your idea was going to interact with the way that the systems that your code is running on actually works, or it's a lie about assumptions of users, it's a lie about logic, it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. Don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him, and so he loses all respect for himself and for others. Last idea. In 1971, the academic John Rawls published a book called The Theory of Justice, right? And Rawls said, okay, he came up with this idea and he said, okay, imagine you're going to have a world that you're going to be born into. And it's going to be a world of enormous inequality, right? And you might, there's like a 30% chance you'll be born as a street beggar with horrible misery. 30% chance you'll just be born into regular middle class. And like a 30% chance that you'll be rich. Now, go design a, so a society. Go design a government. Go design a structure for all of this. Because Rawls' argument is that privilege is not distributed equally, and we know that because we can just observe the way that the world works, right? Rawls is acknowledging this idea, this difference between freedom and opportunity. And Rawls and Raymond were all talking about the same thing, right? That we have to create diverse and inclusive communities. We have to do it because it's foundational to the principle of open source. You can't both believe that the best software is created by the maximum number of eyeballs and the most diversity that we can bring to it and then not want to advocate for inclusion and diversity in your work. You can't believe both of those things at the same time. Inclusion and diversity aren't just nice to have assets for the future of open source software development. They're foundational. And the kind of freedom that we have to preserve doesn't just benefit from it, it requires it. So, in conclusion, we have to recognize that open source is built on a set of ethical principles and that the history of open source is not just a history of engineering, but it's a history of moral decision making that we have an opportunity and a requirement and, yes, in fact, a duty to acknowledge and to carry on. Because as we remake the world through software engineering, we have to be participants in this ethics for a new generation. And we have to re remake our idea of work so that ethics, so that moral reasoning, so that technology can all sit on equal footings and complement each other in our decision making. We must make it so that when the story of our time is written, that we saw some risks inherent in technology before calamity struck, 
and we must make our guidance that of which we steered the ship out of the storm. People people in this room have tremendous, enormous power over the way that the future will work. Because who do you think, where do you think this technology is going to come from if we don't create it? Ever seen a product manager try to write code? It comes from us. We have that power. It's the people in this room who have the power about to shape the world and the virtues and values that we want to ascribe to it. This is not an abstract power. We've shown that open source can influence commercial software and provide a better way if only we step up and do it. So if companies do wrong, let's take open source and let's show them how to do it right. Let's make our path the right one and the correct one to choose. Because the good news for everybody in this room is that as we forge this new path, we have an amazing history to look back on to help us understand how to build our future. We can look back to philosophers and to ethicists and to technologists, and yes, even to software developers. But in the end, we must look to each other. We must expand our communities. We must bring in as many diverse voices as we can. And we must listen to these voices together to build the world that we want to see. What force shall represent the future in the present? We will. Thanks very much. Have a wonderful conference.